Welcome to Instruction Discussion, our weekly look at the latest topics and trends in education affecting schools here on Long Island and schools around the world. Whether you're a teacher, parent, or student, listen for tips and strategies to help you navigate the educational landscape. There's a bell. It's time to start today's instruction discussion on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hello, I'm Kevin Boston Hill, and welcome to Instruction Discussion, where each week we will examine a recent trend or development in education and its impact on Long Island. Today, we will talk with the author of the book, How to Create a Perfect School, Maintain Students' Motivation and Love of Learning from Kindergarten through 12th Grade. Dr. Lee Jenkins. Dr. Jenkins, welcome to Instruction Discussion on 90.3 WHPC. It's great to be with you. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. For our listening audience out there, just give you a quick background. Dr. Lee Jenkins is an author, speaker, and recognized authority in improving educational outcomes with 50 years of experience. Before founding L2J Consulting Services, he worked as a teacher, principal, school superintendent, and university professor. Lee's mission is providing practical, proven solutions for the most perplexing education problems. And I know, especially in this time that we're dealing with, we have a lot of perplexing educational problems. So is it before we really get into today's class, um, is there anything else that you would care to, to share with us of maybe where you started your career, how you got into education, how you got into the work that you're doing? Well, I'll give you a little background. <clears throat> During the time that I was a school superintendent, the American Association of School Administrators sponsored a four-day seminar with 92-year-old W. Edwards Deming. He is the American, <clears throat> excuse me, that, be- that was best known for taking Japanese management to Japan. Mm-hmm. Because uh, that was at the end of World War II. Well, this was the only time he ever spoke to uh, admit to educators, and he threw into it in the middle of it for about uh, two minutes how this, how the statistics would look in education because that that was his field statistics, and that is the foundation of what I do. So you, if people have ever read Deming's writing, they will hear during our time together. Uh, snippets of that that they will recognize is coming from him. Let's, I guess, guess get into it. So what do you, is it that you see as um, one of the, or the major education problem that you are attempting to solve? The, this, I'm glad I said something about Deming. So let's talk about it. Yes. He, he said that in all organizations, government, business, and education, 95 to 96% of the problems are caused by the system, not by the people making mistakes. He also said, if everybody did their best, 95% of our problems would still persist. So that idea of everybody going out there and just doing their best and rah, 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 and we'll solve it, we will not. There are issues we inherited that need to be replaced. And so when you say the top issue, the top issue is we're looking at it as a people problem when really there are some systemic problems. One example, I've never yet met a teacher who said, I really don't care if kids learn this. I just want them to get good grades. I really don't care if they learn it. <laughs> Teachers don't think that. Right. However, starting in first grade, we teach kids how to cram, get a grade, and forget. We do it through spelling. Now, we don't do it on purpose. Right. The teachers are always shocked that the kid spells the word on Monday that they spelled correctly the Friday before. Well, the kid didn't intend to learn it. They only intended to spell it correctly for the Friday test. And right. it just continues all the way on. I was in an annual dermatology exam, sitting there in my underwear. And the doctor said, well, what do you do? I said, well, I, I actually get on airplanes and give a presentation. She said, who to? Well, the teachers and principals. Well, what do you tell them? You know, I was trying to get the conversation over and right. be done, but she was curious. I said, well, I tell them how we can make cramming impossible. You actually have to learn. She said, oh, that's interesting. That's what I did all the way through medical school. So, yeah. So I'm thinking, here I am in the doctor's office, and you're telling me you cram and forget. <laughs> I said, well, you have to learn sometime, don't you? 
She said, well, yes, that's what residency is for. So there is a system. We, in, we have inherited forgetting system instead of a remembering system. And I love that quote. When I read that, I was like, you know, that's exactly right. We, we have in, inherited a forgetting school system as opposed to a remembering school system because we focus on that. That's where I guess the studying for the test comes from. Because yes, yes. Most, because most students that you talk to after taking a test, they can't tell you what they just took. And because no. you know, study just for that, and then it's like it, it just leaves them <laughs> and never to be visited again. Um, so, but I, I, I like that. So, go explain a little bit more about that. What you mean by we are a forgetting school system? That's exactly it. That the kids cram and forget, mm-hmm. and it it switches from spelling tests to chapter tests when they get in the middle school and high school. Um, but it is the same process. Uh, I've had teachers I've worked with in an embarrassing way say, you know, prior to giving them a chapter test. I'd say to the kids, okay, you got five minutes to study before I give you the test. And now they look back on it and they say, how, how, how ridiculous. <laughs> you know, but you really know what they know, not what they learned five, for five minutes. Right. But we do that. That's, we fall into that. And so going back to everybody did their best in a current system, we, the kids would cram and forget with everybody doing their best. Right. So we have to, we have to look at what are the problems – they're built in. And then we, then society thinks, well, it's uh, the private schools must do better. So I told the story in my book, you know, I'm with, we're with some family friends and the, and the uh, granddaughter loves to sing. So grandma says to her granddaughter, uh, Emily, sing for us. So she jumped up happily, ready to sing for my wife, Sandy and I. And before she started to sing, grandma says, Oh, Emily, why don't you tell them that memory, that memory work you've been working with? Because she's going to a private Christian school. Mm-hmm. And the granddaughter says, oh, Grandma, that was just for a test. But I don't remember that. <laughs> and Grandma says, oh, Lee, that's what you've been saying. Exactly. So we tend to think that the charter school or the private school or some other school does it better. And that system of cram, get a grade, and forget permeates everything. And that's, so that's one of the issues. It's not the only issue, but it's one that we inherited. No, it's, that sounds like a, that's a really big issue, though, because, like you said, it permeates no matter what type of educational setting you're in, whether it's public school, district school, charter school, private school, Catholic school, parochial school, it, they all have the same problem. So it seems to be a really big problem in, that uh, I think we yes. address first. Yes, it's huge. Yeah. And Dr. Deming, when I heard him in 1992, described the way to avoid cramming. He described how to make cramming impossible. He didn't use those words, mm. but the statistical process he taught makes cramming impossible. You are listening to Instruction Discussion on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. My name is Kevin Boston Hill. And our guest today is Dr. Lee Jenkins, author of the book, How to Create a Perfect School. So, Lee, you mentioned that you, you have a, a lot of what you do has been, um, I guess, curated by the, uh, the teachings of Dr. Demings. And so talk to me about what was the, I guess, the, the, the impetus for creating this book and, and how do we create a perfect school? How do we define perfect school? The um, perfect, the in improving any organization, we would start with what would perfect be? And we define that. Mm-hmm. Then we say, we will never be perfect. Okay? Then we say, where are we now? And we use our energy and our creativity to establish hypotheses that we can experiment with to see if they will bring us closer and closer and closer and closer to perfect. Knowing we're not going to get there, but we can get closer. So when you define what perfect is, you limit all of the ideas just coming out at you and say, no, no, that doesn't, that's not going to help us. It focuses the thinking. So for my book, How to Create a Perfect School, I define perfect as as a school where 
the love of learning that children bring with them to kindergarten is maintained for the next 12 years. Mm. Because if kids love learning as much in high school as they love it in kindergarten, nothing could hold us back. Nothing. So then how do we do that? How do, and that's what Dr. Deming taught. And because what, what, let me give you one other thing. John Hattie, as an Australian educator, wrote the work Visible Learning. He's been a big influence. Mm-hmm. He gave us the, um, the triplets, Skill, Will, and Thrill. Now, we know that the job of the schools is to impart skill. We know that. The problem is the students are in charge of the will. <laughs> We, as much as we would like as adults to be in charge of how much effort they put in, we're not. We're not you're the right. kids are in charge of the will. So if the kids receive no thrill from learning the skill, they lose their will. So yeah. our job, and that's what Demi taught, how do, we create, how do we create the thrill? Now, when people hear that, they think, oh, the kids want to go to a carnival all the time. No, that's not it. They would and get so tired of that. Uh, that's not it. The thrill is knowing in my heart that I am smarter now than I used to be. Mm. That's one. Yep. And number two, the class as a whole is smarter than it used to be, and I contributed to the success of the team. Those two things strike deep in the heart of a child. Yes. I did it. I did better than ever before. The class did better than ever before, and I helped the class. Mm. It's not that it's, it's it's not what we do, but it's not complicated. Right, and I think it it it, it goes back to that uh, the athletic team um, the thinking about it when you're contributing to the the overall success of the overall team, and not just for. Yes, you're building up your own uh, ac- academics as well, but in your own successes, but all your successes contribute to the overall success of the of the team, whether it's basketball, football, or baseball. And I think that's where uh, the great John Wooden is so important as well. From what he was saying, the, the, the similarities are that there's no way you can't motivate another person because motivation comes from within, but you can create yeah. the scenario you can create the situation to create the environment that will cause the person to motivate him himself or herself. I think that's where we kind of get lost. We forget that part of it. And so well, I guess what you're also saying is that's what we need to think about doing. How is how do we create the environment to make sure that students maintain that love or that inquisitive nature that they develop in kindergarten? all the way through 12th grade and beyond. Okay, so let's go back to Dr. Deming as part of that answer. Mm -hmm. First of all, when you talked about athletics, thank you. So when you go to an athletic event, there's a scoreboard. What is a scoreboard? It's addition. It's simple addition. You add up the contribution of each member on the team. You add it up and you put that number up on a scoreboard. All it is is addition. So and that's what kids want to do. They want to contribute to that total going up, that, that, that addition. They want to add to it. So until I heard Dr. Deming in 1992, I never heard anybody ever say, add up the total correct for the whole class. Nobody said that. We yeah. don't add it up. You've got a science teacher who's also the head football coach. If the scoreboard was broken at the football game, the, the football coach would be really upset. How are we going to know what's going on? And then on Monday morning, the science teacher goes back to the classroom, and it never dawns on him to add up the total for the science students. It would never have dawned on me if I heard or hadn't heard Dr. Deming. So we add it up. Mm. And then we add it up the next time. And we add up the next time trying to do better than we've ever done before. And when we do better than we've done before, the kids get to celebrate. And when I say celebrate, I don't mean a big party. I mean a minute or two to do something fun. In fact, sometimes the kids create things we would never think of. There was an Algebra 2 class that 
the teachers talking about how do we, how are we going to celebrate? And they said, well, I'll tell you what, every time we have an all time best, we'll empty the change in our pocket and we'll put it in the jar. And <laughs> it's not like a celebration. But that's what they did. At the end of the year, they gave $87 to the local humane society. Oh, nice. That, that, see, see what I'm saying? It, that's a celebration, but it's not what adults think would increase, would interest the kids. Right. And no adult would say, okay, I've got an idea. Empty the change in your pocket. No, the kids said that idea. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't always have to be so, a pizza party or an ice cream party at the end of the, the, the week or something, no, right? No. And when we do those ice cream parties, we leave out everybody. We leave out somebody. You only get to go if you do it with what I tell you. Now, let's go back to sports. The baseball coach is happy. The kids won the game. He says to the team, okay. Uh, if you got a hit today, uh, meet me across the street for ice cream. If you didn't get a hit, I'll see you Monday for practice. No coach would do that. Right. right? right. It's a team. Right. It's a team. We all, we won. We all did it together. We're all going to go for ice cream together. Exactly. But in school, we don't do that. Right. No, we have, if we create a team and everybody gets to celebrate. In fact, here's the tearjerker. I can't tell you how many times teachers tell me this with tears in their eyes. There's a kid that's struggling. Every, every class has got some. Mm -hmm. And the class has their all-time best. They have two more questions right than ever before. And the kid that's been struggling stands up in front of the whole room and does a chest pump and says, it was me. My two questions put us over the top. If it hadn't been for me, we wouldn't get to celebrate. Think about that. What a difference it makes. Yeah. And so it is adding, adding it up. Now, I need to digress and talk a little bit about what Dr. Deming taught because you can't add up from chapter tests. It, it doesn't work because that's, you get, you're adding up short-term memory. Right. So you mentioned earlier, Dr. Deming taught, give us, give the kids the list of what you want for the whole year. Tell them, Here's, here it is for the whole year. Here's what I want you to learn. Mm -hmm. And he said, let's say that there were a hundred key concepts for the kids to learn and they have the list. Then seven times every quarter, we give them a quiz on that list, but not a hundred. I mean, that's, that's a killer. Right, right. We, we randomly choose, we randomly choose 10 of them. Square root's the number you choose. So if there were 50 math concepts, the teacher would probably choose seven each time. Okay. Right. So we give them a quiz on what we want them to know at the end of the year. And they don't know very many in the beginning. And as we teach all through the year in a logical way, they do better and then better and better and better, and they get to see their personal improvement. But they can't. But when you say, well, how are you learning that? How come you're doing that? You say to a kid, they say, well, I've learned it. Well, and then and they compare. Well, with chapter tests, you cram and forget. But when you got the whole list for the whole year, you can't cram that much. Right. You, you have to. Say, well, what are you going to do? Well, I'm just going to learn it. Okay. What, an, what a novel idea. I'm just going to learn it. Yeah. Right. Because so that's what gives you added up and we get that growth. Yes. Right. There's a lot of also I heard a lot of Carol Dweck's work in in what we were talking about as well. We'll, we'll get to in, in one second. You are listening to Instruction Discussion on the voice of NASA Community College 90.3 WHPC. My name is Kevin Boston Hill and our guest today is Dr. Lee Jenkins, author of the book How to Create a Perfect School. A lot of through reading the book and listening to you now um, I also heard a lot of Carol Dweck in as far as um, this idea of the growth mindset. And so that you, you give students a, a baseline and then however much they can improve what their improvement is, as opposed to giving them just the, the final score. And so you celebrate the improvement that they've made. And, and I think that's, that's huge. That's huge in education because we, it's huge. we don't do that. As for the most part, we call um, our schools, we say that we're in teams and teachers refer to their class as teams and, and so forth, but yet they still grade individually. They still uh, celebrate yes. individually, this individually as opposed, as you said, looking at the, the overall contributions that, that are made. Um, so talk a little bit about how, we are, or how you were able to kind of, uh, I guess, marry the the teachings as well as the influence of Dweck and 
and uh, other people that you have uh, come across to come up with your particular solutions. And in the and in the course of that, tell us what the the biggie is. I have emailed Carol Dweck, mm-hmm. and and I have two things. One, um, I interviewed, I surveyed three thousand teachers, and I asked them what grade level they taught. And what percent of the kids left school at their grade level? And I made a graph out of it. Mm. It goes from 95% of the kids left school in kindergarten, and then 90% in, 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 in first grade. Time you get to the end of elementary school and fifth grade, we're down to about 65%. Wow. We're on the middle school, it jumps down to around half. You get to ninth grade, it's 37% of the kids left school. Wow. And so I shook here and said, this is a picture of a fixed mindset. She wrote back and said, yes, it's a fixed mindset. It's what it looks like. Now, I know that our teachers want a growth mindset. In their heart, they want it. They don't know how to create it because they, we inherited a fixed mindset. Yes. We're the same kids that get all of the awards in kindergarten are the same kids that have a special ribbon around their neck at graduation. It's fixed. Mm. And, um, and so th- we, I know they want a growth mindset. They don't know how. So we have to help them learn how to do that. And, and, and they, they can. And, and then, and I don't know who's happier with a growth mindset, the kids or the teachers, <laughs> because they love it. And then even further, when you have this, this uh, chart that's showing the total correct each week and going up and up, up over the year, at the end of the year, they write down the best week they had, how many they had right. Then the next year, what's the goal? Mm. Beat last year. That's, we don't pull a number out of the air for a goal. We try to do better. It's like a, back to athletics. There yeah. are records at the school of athletics, and 20 years later, some, some kids beats it. Okay? But every year, they're trying to do, get that school record. Okay? Right. Well, that's what they do in the class. They're trying to get the record. And say we we our class did better than this teacher's ever had before. So it's it has similarities to athletics, except the competition is between our former self and our current self, not between us and another classroom. Right. So in high schools, for example, the tendency is to, is to make it a contest. So the teacher has five periods of math. Mm-hmm. They make it a contest between each of the five periods, and the winner class gets the ice cream. And so you have one winter class and four discouraged classes. Right. That, make it, that, that, that makes sense. What we do is we add up the total for all five classes together. And the teacher can say, wow, look, you're only with me, you're only with me one hour a day, but I'm in here five hours a day, and, and look how we're all doing. Yeah. I don't think there's a teacher or a person on the planet who, will, who won't disagree or who will disagree with the statement that none of us is as smart as all of us. Right, so we we should benefit collective. Right. We benefit from the collective knowledge in the room. So why not do that or teach the students how to do that in the classroom? And so that instead of competing against each other, we're working with each other for towards a common goal. But we're really, like you said, competing against ourselves because we're trying to better ourselves, and that's where we develop that growth mindset. Mm-hmm. Right, you got it exactly right. That. And the, the joy that comes, um, one, you know, one of the uh, main issues of my teaching is to stop using data for discouragement and instead use data for joy. When kids get a, a, a paper back that's been scored, they don't look to see how many they missed. They look to see if they did better than ever before. That's right. what we want. Students, who, that's the attitude. Did I, did I do better than I've ever done before? That's what we're after. That's what we're after. So, let, so tell me, and everyone else listening in as well. Um, besides this current book that we're talking about, um, how to create a perfect school, is there any other any other publications or research that would be helpful to to people who are trying to create that perfect school that would assist them in getting their schools, getting their students to think in a, a more of a growth mindset that we're describing here. Well, the book I did prior to this was called entitled Optimize Your School. Mm. And it has more uh, data in there for leaders. It's a, it's a more of a leadership book 
then the then the optimize your school and then the how to create a perfect school is more for leaders and teachers together. So that is another resource that that uh, could be helpful. But my website, which is lbellj.com, the letter L is in my first name Lee, the word bell or ring the bell, and the letter J is my last name Jenkins dot com. Is actually the, that is not because of my initials. It's the shape of one of the graphs we create because the we go from an L-shaped curve in the beginning of the year to a bell curve in the middle of the year to a J curve at the end of the year. On that website are video. Uh, Jack Canfield interviewed me who did the Chicken Soup for the Souls books. Yes. There's an interview there by him. There's an interview from a, 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 a video from a seventh grade history class. Lots of free resources that can be of help to people. And by the way, if there's parents listening to this, uh, in the How to Create a Perfect School, there's five chapters there for parents. And there's a parent a tab on my website with some things that parents can download to help with the growth mindset uh, at home in addition to the growth mindset at school. Well, wow. I mean, I could have this conversation with you all day and, and because I just find it very fascinating to discuss, one, where we are in education, where we've been, and mm-hmm. to say, there's still hope. Because, well, I guess we still have the the competing district schools and and charter schools and private schools and so forth. But we're all in the same business to do the same thing, to to teach and educate our youth. And and I think if we start to think about things in terms of how we can make the system better for everyone, as opposed to, well, we have to do better than that district and we have to do better than that type of school and so forth we would see a great amount of change and we would see a, a good um, difference in the, in the way that our students operate and how they remember things and how they learn things. Again, I thank you for the, for having this conversation with me today. And if you have anything else that you would like to, any nugget, one thing that you could think about that uh, you could leave our guests with, what would that final thought be? Well, let me just say that it's, it's, it's just, language. But when I, I put a title on that graph where every year fewer, more and more students just like school, mm-hmm. I called it, call it the pain train. Then all the graphs where it's going up, those are the hope slopes. So my mission is to derail the pain train and help kids climb hundreds of hope slopes. And so we'll end with that. Excellent. Excellent. Derail the pain trains and develop more hope slopes. I, I like that. I like that. So we'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Lee Jenkins, author of the book, How to Create a Perfect School, for coming in and joining us in class today. Once again, my name is Kevin Boston Hill, and thank you all for listening to Instruction Discussion, right here on the voice of Nestle Community College Radio, 90.3 WHPC.